Naveen, as I mentioned before, you are president of Cisco Systems Across Asia, which is the acronym for the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which is a regional grouping of 10 member states. We've asked you to frame today's topic by summarizing the results of a major study carried out by Cisco and Oxford Economics on the future impact of technology across the Asian job market. Naveen, please. Thanks so much, uh, Richard, and very pleased to uh, to be here. Thank you also to Thomas um, from Swiss Re, and really excited that, that we could have this conversation about aging. Um, I did do, uh, I, I sponsored a big study. I didn't do it myself. I sponsored a big study. I was, I was a leader of the team, and it was a very quantitative study. And what I wanted to do is just share a few parts of that study uh, with you all today. Uh, and and as I kind of as I kind of blow it up and get it up on the screen, um, I just wanted to kind of highlight that, you know, there's so much that's happened uh, with AI and the advent of AI on, on, the, on the workforce that it can't possibly be summarized in five or seven minutes. So I'll do my best, but what I just want to start out with this. I mean, I think many of you would recognize this. Uh, this looks like a car. It is a car. It's probably something you've never driven because this is, this is a car, I think, from the 1940s or something like that. But um, what was interesting about this picture when I looked at it is that this is a very complex kind of machinery and, and required a lot of skill to handle, but it essentially only had a couple of uh, dials of information. You can see here that there was a speedometer, there was a fuel, a fuel tank, and if you were lucky, um, a radio dial, you know, to sort of look at the radio. And the radio was the only sort of interactive thing about it. You turned it and it sort of did something back in return. If you look at a car today, it's a very different proposition. You know, you're getting a lot more information as you drive this car. And this information is being processed in real time by our brains and we've gotten used to it uh, so that we are able to adapt and, and, and change as we are on the road, picking up information and reacting and responding. Hence, the, 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 the nature of work has changed. The nature of driving has changed. It may not feel any different, but it is very, very different. We're picking up on so much more information. And our bodies and our minds have changed as a result. So as I was looking at this, we were thinking like, what has happened to the workforce or what will happen to the workforce as we start to embrace technology from the fourth industrial revolution? And just to remind people about this, I mean, there are four, five essential key technologies that are uh, shaping the industrial revolution. The, the first is the, you know, the internet of things, which is on, on, on the right hand side here, the first thing. Uh, and, and we see that every device is being connected and, and every device is actually collecting information or translating information to commands. And then there's the artificial intelligence layer where you start to see a lot of machine learning and AI. And then 3D printing, you know, sort of building of new technologies um, through, through assembly of parts in a very, very local environment. And then advanced robotics supporting our decision making and supporting our activities which will of course, you know, is a natural one to displace jobs because lots of manual work will essentially be displaced by, by robotics. And then finally, of course, wearables, um, sort of uh, AR, VR, sort of augmented reality and virtual reality and wearables that will start to permeate into society in much more sustainable ways. Now, the key thing is these five technologies all coming together will have a shift in, in the way in which we do things. And what we did is we quantified this. So we worked, we looked at, 21 industries, we assembled uh, task profiles of 433 occupations based on a 41 task typology uh, system from ONET. And we worked with Oxford Economics to say, well, with these five technologies coming in place, what would it do to the nature of activities? So the 41 task typologies we looked at and we said, these kind of activities would be replaced by AI or AR or VR or by Internet of Things and any of one of those five technologies. But in true economist kind of mindset of thinking, while certain tasks would be replaced, other tasks would be created. And hence, as you start to map out, you know, the jobs displacement, you start to see that jobs are not necessarily lost, but they are displaced. And the majority of jobs that are being displaced are in Indonesia and in Vietnam on an absolute level and on a percentage basis, Singapore. Interestingly enough, 21%, almost 21% of the entire labor force in Singapore would be displaced. Now, let me remind you, this is based on an activity level assessment across 433 occupations, 41 different activities, 21 industries. 
So this led to a lot of discussion with the various governments that we have in Southeast Asia. If a fifth of the workforce is essentially displaced, what does that mean by industry? And what we found is we actually analyzed this by industry. So we found that if you look at the green bars, the green bars all add up to that 28 million, uh, the 28 million jobs that we displaced. But the right-hand side is that the income effect. So as you start to realize productivity gains, what happens is, is that classical economic theory says that you will reinvest those productivity gains into other industries and new services would be created. And those new services would require a new kind of worker. So if I go back to the driving example, in agriculture, that I've seen many um, um, farms in, in Southeast Asia, like in the Philippines, banana plantations, where there are lots of people going around doing picking and packing. Those jobs would be changed, but they'd be changed into working with more um, uh, uh, machine, uh, interpreting data from machines, as we are looking at that new car, the Mercedes car on the right-hand side, if you remember, there's a lot more interacting with data and interacting with machines. So the workers that were on the plant that were picking and packing now have to re react and deal with data coming from machines. Hence, new jobs would be created in agriculture, 4.2 million new jobs. So that fundamentally alters the nature of work. So what you'll see is some industries would have even more jobs created than jobs displaced, like manufacturing. We, we saw that 4.3 million jobs would be, would be displaced but 4.9 million jobs would be uh, created. Interestingly enough, wholesale and retail, 4.4 and, and 6.1. And then if you look at other industries like, um, uh, let's take uh, you know, uh, the traditional ones like hotels and restaurants, you see also, interestingly enough, 2 million jobs created out of 1.7. And then finance and insurance, where many people are on this call, very interesting in Southeast Asia, a double the amount of jobs created in the finance and insurance. It's very good for the insurance industry <laughs> overall, I would say, but a new skill set would be required. So we also looked at it by job function. I won't spend too long on this, but we did find that in Southeast Asia, it was mostly the elementary workers that will be displaced. That's the ones at the bottom here. Ones that didn't have a uh, standardized uh, education up to say K to 12. Um, so it's important to continue the focus on education but also some of the managers will be displaced and the, and the top, top end of the workers. So the kind of work needed would be different. And we found that the skill set needed to be uplifted. So we actually measured um, the skill set using an, a, a, an index that we, had, that we had created, this general index. We found that massive skill is needed, uplift and skills are needed. And, and you see here 14 points increase needed in Singapore. When you think it's quite an advanced nation, still massive skills uplift needed. And we found that if you look at the different areas of IT, operations, um, um, management, and some general science and math disciplines, across the board, we saw different kinds of gaps. So for example, we found 12%, 41% were lacking IT skills. 12% were lacking operational skills. Even the more basic foundational skills like active learning, speaking, writing, lacking of skills, um, and then, of course, on the management side, uh, clearly uh, skills lacking there as well. And if I was to just look at this by an overwhelming large number of ASEAN workers, I'm going to leave this last point with you. An overwhelming large number of ASEAN workers will require reskilling in order to be relevant in the future. 1.7 million will need more foundational skills. Um, 1.9 million will need more skills like negotiation, persuasion. Uh, 800,000 need more IT skills like programming systems analysis and around a million more needing management skills. So this commitment to lifelong learning and reskilling is absolutely essential for, for the future. So I'm just going to pause there and, and stop there, actually. And that is just for starters. Thanks very much, Naveen. Uh, that sets us up very well for our, our next speaker. Uh, Thomas, you know, as the head of HR at Swiss Re, I'm, I'm expecting you to, to say, you know, for the reskilling challenge, the future is now. Uh, what's happening in the case of Swiss Re? Good morning, everyone, for, for the ones in, in Europe. So my name is Thomas. I'm heading up the HR team for, for Switzerland in, at Swiss Re. And um, our key priority from a people perspective is the topic of generation management in, in our location. And this is very closely intertwined with the topic of reskilling our workforce. So there are several influencing factors on the topic of reskilling and generation management. And um, there are many more. It's not exclusive what you see on, on this page, but let me 
uh, say a few words around them. So the first one is around demographic change. And um, I think this is really accelerating in the Western, in the Western world. And um, according to a PwC story in Europe, for every four working people per elderly person in 2050, by 2050, the relationship will be just two working people for, for, for an elderly individual. So this shortfall will require a greater workforce participation by two groups, women and elderly themselves. Um, the good thing is that we see an increasing lifespan, right? So people live longer, the living healthier, and the health span increases. So the 100 plus year life is no longer an illusion. The flip side around that is it's also about financing the 100 plus year life and prepare our people um, for financial resilience. We put a little question mark behind the, the bullet here of retirement age, because what we see is that people want to keep working past traditional retirement age and continue to contribute to society, but also to, to their employ, employers in order to provide meaning for their own lives. So there was a recent um, study from the Swiss Insurance Association and more of 50% of the working population confirmed um, that there, there would be an incentive for them to reduce working time um, to, to really stay longer in the workforce, right? So this gradual re reduction out of, um, out of the workforce into retirement is, is desperately needing. There's an element of shifting perception as well, particularly um, targeted at recognizing the importance of every generation in the workforce. At Swiss, we have right now four generations in the workforce. And we have all heard about the stereotypes of, of older workers, um, particularly related to, to untrainable, unable to use technology or, or resistance to change. However, we believe that we actually need to recognize much, much more the elderly workers for the capabilities, experience, and forward-looking thinkings. And the last point here is around new job profiles. And um, I like to make the link here to Naveen's presentation because actually the numbers in Switzerland, Switzerland are not looking that dissimilar. So there was a, a research done by McKinsey in Switzerland in 2018, and they came to the conclusion that 1 million of jobs will disappear by 2030. So 20 to 25% of all jobs will be automated during that time. That's the expectation. And that's the responsibility now of the companies and education providers to, to come in and particularly reskill on similar skills Naveen has mentioned on, on technology, software, etc. So we can say with, with, with some security that today's competencies are not matching what, what's required in the future. So for us, the main question really is how do we prolong the working life of elderly employees, while at the same time we need to upskill not only them, but actually every single employee in our organization. And you see at the bottom the key conclusion we, we actually made. I mean, we will not change the demographic trends, but we can change how we can respond to it. So let me speak quickly about generations at, at Swiss Re. So why did we put this as our key priority? The so business case is quite simple. So over the next 10 years, um, around one third of our employees will leave the company due to normal and regular retirement. So I'm speaking here around a thousand employees. We have uh, over three and a half thousand employees in the location right now. So it's a significant risk of losing knowledge. And if you add then the, the factor in of long service with the company, it's, um, it's really something we, we need to work on right now and we can't wait any longer. So I'd like to share with you three concrete examples. There are more we have um, on how we mitigate the risk by pushing out the retirement age, but also to upskill our people. So the first one is an internal concept uh, which has been globally rolled out, um, which is called leadership from every seat. In the, in, in, in the nutshell, this concept empowers everyone to, to deliver the best every day and demonstrate leadership, irrespective of hierarchy, title, or age. So it's a shared responsibility between the employee and an employer to define effective upskilling and solution in order to be really well equipped um, for the years to come. In the middle, and here like to, to, to dig a little bit deeper, is the topic of lifelong learning. So the length of career is increasing and the shelf time of skills declines simultaneously 
which confirms the necessity of lifelong learning. So we have, um, we have introduced a system um, which we call lifelong learning. And this is a state of the art digital learning platform, which enables our employees to learn whenever and wherever they like to do. So let me briefly elaborate a bit more on the topic. So we are using internal and external learning resources and every employee can create and create learning content and different learning pathways for them. So external content can be easily embedded such as from partner platforms, um, such as LinkedIn, etc. So the platform is open for all kinds of learning. So you can have really intensive learning sessions over multiple hours, but you can also integrate it into smaller compressed learning nuggets to integrate it into your daily, daily routine. And every people manager in the organization is, is able to create learning journeys for the team members to really focus the team on certain skills they need to develop. And finally, it's also about the social learning. It's a social learning platform. So you can like and share a little bit what you what you know from Netflix, right? I mean, you can you can you, you can follow certain certain learning channels, you can subscribe to them, and you can um, be always informed about areas of interest. I, I like to share with you a bit of statistics on the right hand side, which shows a bit the user data of our our employees. So which areas of interest they are having. So um, the first one is around leadership, which um, I, I think it's, it's a very relevant one, this one, because the notion of leadership is changing in light of the digital, in light of the digital change and transformation we are seeing. But we are also seeing at the second, which is not surprising, reinsurance fundamental as a reinsurance companies, right? Our people are interested in, in learn about it. But then we also have the new technologies really on top with data science and analysis, digital transformation, which really shows that our people are taking the development seriously and enrolling to the, to, to the, to the classes. We also have on the right side, uh, on the bottom, you see the um, a word cloud of the top 50 searched um, skills in, in our organization. And you see also the leadership from every seed concept, which I, was referring to earlier, but you see also notions like project management, agility, data science, which are coming, which are coming up. Um, and finally, I'd like to show one, one minute on um, providing optionality. And this is a very important step Swissy has taken um, earlier this year to offer flexible working options for the employees in our head of in our head office in Switzerland. So the notion of optionality is absolutely key for us and empowers our people and line managers to choose the way how they want to work it, right? We have various forms of part-time working, career breaks, contractor agreements beyond retirement. We introduce the new flexible working options where our employees have more flexibility in buying additional vacation, vacation days. Um, and we also like, and that's something we really like to work on, on over the coming years, to allow our people to gradually step back from their full-time responsibility. And with this solution, we are aiming to retain our older and highly skilled employees longer in the workforce, and that they can transfer the skills also to, over to the younger generation. So in summary, we, in, at Swiss, we are convinced about the need to reskill and adapt our workforce to meet the future requirement in the reinsurance sector. And in terms of responsibility, we as a company, we like to provide the right infrastructure, the framework and policy to tackle the demographic and reach a skilling challenge. But at the same time, we also require each employee to, to fully own their career and live and breathe our leadership from every seed concept. So with this, I'd like to hand back to, to Richard. Thanks very much, Thomas. I mean, that's really a, the, the Rolls Royce of uh, you know, reskilling and, and, and uh, HR performance. So, so let's go back to Asian and uh, Southeast Asia now with Naveen. And it's really great having you here with us, Naveen, because often the spotlight in Asia or when focusing on Asian economies is, is usually China. But uh, it's good to have someone from, from Asian, which is a huge region. Look. I'm gonna combine a question here for you, Naveen. Um, how are the Asian economies coming out of COVID is one question because we've seen uh, what Swiss Re is doing uh, on this subject. Uh, how far off are we across Asian in coming up with these sort of, uh, at a company level, these sort of programs? 
Yeah, no, it's it's a, it's a good question because COVID has actually accelerated the um, the, the need for reskilling in a way. Um, I mean, just take uh, one topic, which is the topic of collaboration. Uh, collaboration in teams has been a big factor which we took for granted, frankly, uh, because we used to go to a workplace and we used to meet our colleagues there and we used to have an environment where we could potentially kind of innovate in, in, in a working environment. And uh, now we are in a force to, to work all in a distributed workforce environment. And we need to essentially collaborate and innovate in, in this kind of dispersed environment. And that's forced us to rethink our toolkit and our reskilling efforts. Uh, so I think on that sense, in that sense, it's been a challenge for most companies. Um, I mean, companies have to do a lot to, they have to think a lot about how do I secure my remote workers? Uh, because, you know, when you're working from home and you're dealing with com confidential information, you know, it's, it's different from when you go to the office and you're in a secure environment. Um, the second thing I think the companies are thinking about is how do I prepare my workplace for a safe return to the office? Um, and so when my workers do come into the office, that they're able to work and they're able to deal with uh, the matters at hand, but not you know, result in any, any infections that rise in the workplace, which is creating risk, of course. And then lastly, how do I ensure that my, 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 my real estate footprint that I used to have uh, is adequately uh, utilized? You know, because it seems like for the next 18 months, maybe even some argue forever, work has changed uh, for office going, uh, you know, uh, if you like the, the traditional white collar worker. So, you know, that, that, that's where I think the Southeast Asian countries are struggling with right now um, for, the, for the office workers. Um, the biggest issue for the, the, those that have to be in a place of, of work um, is that they need to be able to conduct their, their duties uh, effectively keeping social distancing in place. And that requires a completely different skill set again. So I'm here, I'm talking about retail workers, I'm talking about workers that are, you know, critical workers that need to be there for supply chain activities. There's lots of areas where reskilling is fundamentally needed and innovation is needed. So um, for me, this has been a period of innovation. It's been an, it's been an ex excellent period where companies are forced to rethink not just companies, even governments are forced to rethink how do I deliver a service or deliver my product in a completely different environment than I was ever exposed to before. And that is quite an exciting place to be right now. But, but, but Naveen, I mean, there's such diversity across the cultures in Southeast Asia, isn't there? I mean, yeah. you know, we have yeah. Indonesia with you know, 250 million people, and then we've got Singapore, which is right up the top there, you know, in the world competitiveness rankings. I mean, how are governments and companies across this region able to do what you're saying? I mean, innovation is in general across the region in this yeah. way, is it? Yeah, so I think, I think what we've seen is that countries like, uh, let's take one, both extremes, let's take the other end of the extreme, say Indonesia or, or potentially even the Philippines, um, where things have gotten a little bit uh, more out of control, I would say, not, not, not out of control, but, but less control. Um, there's been a huge uh, focus towards being self-sustaining. And I think it's sort of propagated a little bit by the politics of the world in a way as being much more, you know, Let's look at our own market, our own kind of, let's be self-sufficient and self-reliant, self, self um, which, which, you know, that's been a focus, I think, uh, to make sure that we don't, are not dependent on global supply chains. Um, and then countries that are more dependent on international trade uh, have tried to find a way to kind of uh, ensure that the trade flows uh, are, are, are happening without any, you know, huge disruption to policy. What, what has happened is that there's been a, the fiscal, the, the stimulus packages that have come in, in Indonesia, in Singapore, in Thailand, they've all been very different. They've all been very different and they've all been focused on the domestic issues. And so, and a large proportion of that has actually gone into reskilling. So it's been interesting to see that a large proportion of, of, of the stimulus packages are actually focused on reskilling. And we've been looking at that as well by working with some of the national governments on that, on that basis as well. A lot on technology reskilling as well. Look, uh, let me throw it over to, to Thomas on that particular point. Thomas, you, you were talking a lot about lifelong learning. It's also something I know that Naveen is 
is, is very interested in as, as well. Where does the responsibility for this really sit? Is it with individuals? Is it with the companies? Is it with the governments? What, what's happening in Europe on this particular point? So um, I, 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 do, I do believe it's the government, it's the employer as well as the employee. I think where we, where we see some really a change is um, the, the days in which the employer is planning the career for an employee is also gone, right? I mean, we really need the employees to take on full ownership for their development. They need to reflect on what they're good at, where they need to develop. They need to think about how, uh, how long will I work? Um, they need to think where they would like to work. So I think that that responsibility has shifted over the years um, from, from the employer over to the employee. However, as the employer, um, I do believe there is a responsibility to pro provide the infrastructure. So I was speaking about our platform, which we, which we have int introduced. So we need to provide the space that people can learn and um, are willing to learn. We also need to, um, to really invest in the leadership skills because leading these days is different than it has been a few decades ago. Um, and on the, on, uh, on the government side, I think there's, um, I think we obviously have um, in, 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 in Switzerland or in other European countries, we do have um, particular programs for younger employees like apprentice programs, et cetera. And we have these dialogues that we um, with the governments on how to improve those, those programs. Um, I think we could be a little bit quicker on those things, right? Because the, the environment is rapidly changing, but the content of those uh, programs is not, not uh, changing at the same pace, right? So that's a little bit of concern. I'm, I'm, I'm generally happy, um, but I'm generally happy with uh, the quality of, um, in particular, the younger generation coming in from, from the graduates, from the universities we are seeing. I think there's a really a very, very good quality of candidates we are we are seeing coming coming in, uh, into our workforce. So basically, so in, in simple words, I think it's a it's a it's a blended responsibility between government, but predominantly between the employee and the employer. Look, look, Naveen, obviously this is something that you're also very interested in. I know you've been quite close to the Singapore government on the, the reskilling issues, but once again, with this diversity, uh, how do you handle lifelong learning across these different countries? Do you have some examples that you could give us about what's happening in Asia? Yeah, no, I think we have to start with, um, and this is the message we as a company, uh, you know, as also have also been giving and myself as an individual generally believe in, is we have to start with this, um, this, this mindset of, you know, it's not just important to go ahead and get a degree and that's the end of your studies. You know, that, that, that's what I grew up in, right? You know, you, you, it's very kind of like, hey, you go to school, get good grades, you then go to a bachelor's, maybe a master's, maybe a PhD, that's the end of it. Um, that's just so not true, because if you look at the average age, I mean, I was amazed. I looked at the average age rising and we, we were in this conversation talking about aging in general as well. And I was looking at the average numbers and, and for Asia Pacific, the average age for a man in Asia Pacific overall back in the 1950s was about 52. Um, and now that's risen to well above 80, 85. And assuming you know, the, bi the biology of it kind of continues in the same way, then we could see ourselves maybe living to say 100, maybe 110, I don't know. Um, there are already people living well well in excess of 100 already, the people I know myself as well, not just the ones you read about in the newspapers. So what would you do if you're 110 years old? I mean, does that mean the last time you studied was when you were 26? And then what does that mean for the next you know, 70 years of your life? So we have to realize that we have to constantly reskill. I was very inspired by a woman in Kerala and India who at the age of 98 is now going for her standard uh, nine exam. That's a year nine exam. That's the equivalent of the GCSE uh, exam. Uh, she's the oldest, uh, oldest person in the world to, to will graduate at, at grade nine uh, at 98 years old. And she was illiterate until then. And, and just like three, four years ago, she was illiterate. She couldn't read or write any language. So it just shows you the power of human potential to just keep learning year after year after year and forcing yourself to learn something new. I have these guitars behind me. I need to learn how to play a guitar as well. That's the other thing that's on my list. 
<laughs> okay, well, good luck with the guitars. Uh, maybe when you're 98, you'll be able to have a stab at it. Uh, look, uh, Thomas, throwing it back to you, we had a question come in from our audience, uh, for both of you, actually. Uh, could you speak a little bit about the potential for widening inequality as those least skills are left behind by not realizing the need for reskilling or having the means to do so before it's too late? Uh, maybe you first, Thomas, and then afterwards, Naveen, uh, with the Asian experience. Um, so I think it was it goes it goes back to my, my my point I made before, right? So it's so fundamental. So we as an organization, we need to work harder on really to understand which skills are needed in our organization over the next ten years, right? So really see for each and every function, job, family, etc., where we need to go. And I think that's the responsibility we have in, in our human resource departments. It's also the responsibility of, um, of the line managers to really think through what's the technology impact on, on a certain job profile, right? We have a very diverse population in, 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 in Switzerland, right? I mean, we do have in, in our head office in general, right? I mean, we have, first of all, we have uh, over 80 nationalities, right? I mean, we have, um, uh, very, very diverse people in terms of, I mean, we, are, we have a huge area of gastronomy, we have an area where we have underwriters, actuaries in the client markets, we have, we have primary insurance skills, um, we have obviously a huge operations, IT department, etc. So we, we really need to think through what, what does the strategic workforce plan for those um, for those areas look like. And I think that's, that's responsible to be we in HR in, in partnership with the business leader need, need to take on. And um, on the other, I think we need to bring along the individuals, right? This is so, so important. Um, I mean, we have, we have changed this year for, for the entire organization um, from an annual performance conversation and an annual uh, performance check-in and development conversation to a regular conversation. So this is topic. So I'm doing, for instance, with my with my direct reports, I'm doing really every three months, I'm doing check-ins, right? How is the developmental journey? How, which skills do we need to develop further? Um, and then trying to learn, particularly on, on the job, right? So the 70, 20, 10 rules, so 70% should be on the job, 20% for mentoring coaching and 10% and rather through traditional classroom training. I think that's something we really like to put into, into, into practice. Um, yeah, and, and uh, I think that's, that's, that's so important that this employee side, that's, therefore I'm emphasizing it again. I think um, we really need to encourage everyone to, to be a little bit more selfish on their own, on their own career. Okay, got it. Uh, over to you, Naveen, what's, what's happening yeah. in your neck of the woods? Yeah, no, it's been it's been very very um, um, apparent that the the technology transformation that we are going under is very much skewed towards those that have the, the technology and those that don't have it get left behind. Even more so during COVID. And look, I I thought about it. I, I heard these arguments being made over and over again. I live in Asia where I see inequality, um, but I never felt it until COVID happened, you know, and I'll give you an example. It's a very jarring example. So I apologize for those on the, on the call who find it maybe too, too jarring, but it will send you the signal of what is the reality of the inequality that's happening. So I know that people, kids in Indonesia who have been told to work from, to study at home because of COVID were sent home, okay? Now for all of us, we go home, we have a home, we have a roof, we have, but many kids, a lot of kids don't have a home. They live in a mud hut, okay? They live in a mud hut and then they're told to go home and study. And they don't have any books, they don't have any computer and they don't have an internet, but they do have a smartphone. So their assignments are sent by a smartphone. Now the challenge is this, you, you send a child, a 13, 14 year old child home to work from home. What, what happens is, is that studies don't, you don't get to study. You basically get asked to go help your family in the field or in the, in the village distributing you know, cigarettes or whatever that they're doing to help the family kind of make ends meet. And when they do get a chance to study, there's nowhere to really study. You're working off a very small phone that is very old 
and there's no internet access. And I've heard stories of, of girls who are, you know, selling their bodies to earn money so they can buy a data card so they can actually submit their homework. And in order to submit their homework, they need to climb to the top of a tree to get a signal. Okay, so you can imagine what is going through the minds of these girls that are being asked to work from home. It, 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 it doesn't happen. Whereas there are the privileged uh, families like ours. You know, we live in a house, I'm in the basement now, my wife's upstairs, my kids have their own room. I've got three boys, they each have their own room and they can study. They have a, they have a nice, nice laptop, they have one, you know, 250 Mbps connections, right? It's all perfect. But there are kids out there that don't have that experience and they're getting left behind. The same happens for workers in the, in, who are in mid-career or workers who are, say, towards the end of their career, trying to transition into a new role, but they can't get access to that skilling, that reskilling, so they get left behind. So I think it's a very good question. It's one that we need to think about deeply about because there is a lot of people getting left behind. I mean, that's the, the real digital divide in... Uh very bleakly, as you put it there, Naveen, but thank you for, for also sharing that. Uh, well, then, this I ask a, there's a big question here to be asked. Both of you touched on formal education. Uh, what's the fate of it? I mean, we heard from Thomas, uh, you know, the, the, the issue with vocational education, which is very good in continental Europe. I mean, you know, this situation where a lack of formal you know, institutions actually pushes people further into poverty. I mean, how are we going to cope with this? And I'll throw in a word there, ecosystems and systems thinking, you know, how, how do we cope with this on the education side? Naveen. Um, it's not easy. I think what, what does need to happen is, is that we do need to ensure that there is enough opportunities to learn and, um, so let's say you are, uh, uh, if you're an HR leader at Swiss Re, uh, excellent. I mean, I saw the three pillars of Thomas's strategy. I mean, it's an amazing opportunity to learn. Um, what would be very interesting to know is how many Swiss Re employees are going down each of those paths. And is there something more that HR teams can do to encourage the adoption of those paths? Because that's an amazing opportunity. I mean, I was looking at thinking, wow, I would love to have that opportunity as well. Right. But I mean, many of us have competing priorities. We've got the business to run or we've got family commitments. Are we taking advantage of all of the opportunities? That's question number one. The second is for those at the bottom of the pyramid, are there uh, access? Is, it's an access issue. Can we provide access to those that are not getting those opportunities that will allow them to sit on a slightly higher pedestal so they can progress through society? Uh, and then the third one, which I think is to me, the most important one is, can we transform our K to 12 institutions, our schooling institutions, so that they encourage a lifelong ambition for learning, as in the whole purpose of the organization, the whole purpose of, of kindergarten and right up to grade 12 is not to get a degree, but it is to encourage the curiosity to continue to learn more every day, every year, until you are the day you die. If that is the purpose of education, then that is currently not the not is not what's happening with K to twelve institutions. Currently, it's all about getting you prepared for going to university or for something else. So I think that there's a bigger change that needs to happen with the K to twelve institutions, so that they prepare us for a life of continual learning. Uh, Thomas, uh, you heard the question there on the uptake of Swiss Re employees from Naveen. I mean, that's one angle. And, and also your thoughts on, the, on this issue. Um, so in terms of the, because um, I spoke a lot about the optionality and the flexible working arrangement. I mean, there is definitely room for improvement. While I think the pre prevailing working percentage um, in our head office is at 100%. Um, I mean, it's it's full time and there is a, you know, pe people are retiring earlier than the normal retirement age, et, et cetera. And I think that's a strategy we have laid out for the coming years um, in which we really need to invest um, more time into a dialogue between line manager and employee, right? I think that's absolutely 
important. Um, I think the pick the pickup here I, I expect um, will be will be rather high because we know from our employees, but also from the market, we have different conversations with our people as well, and that there is a need for flexibility and flexible flexible working time. So I I'm I'm really confident that we are having the right frameworks in place and um, for for our people. But the dialogue needs to happen between my manager and the peaks. In terms of the lifelong learning, I mean, I showed um, some examples of um, the areas of interest. I mean, there were a couple of thousands of people interested in leadership and reinsurance fundamentals. I don't have the cut by, by region and demographics, right? It might be an interesting one, whether the younger generations are looking for different skills than, than the older generations. So I'm, that might be a very interesting statistic to, to see. But this will also help us, if we see the interests of our people, to to also design learning content. And not everything will be online, right? To be, to be frank, right? I think particularly if you have visited leadership classes in the past, right? As, as an example, as a people leader, the exchange with uh, the physical ex exchange with people in a meeting room, in a workshop, it's so important, right? So I, um, with all respect to all the technology we are having, but there is still, I, I, I believe there is room in the future also for face-to-face -face interactions and and training. So um, I think in terms of lifelong learning, I think the pickup is, 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 is quite positive. Actually, we had quite a boost through the lockdown we, we have experienced earlier in the year, right? which was, um, was a, a perfect storm for us. Thanks very much, Thomas. Uh, we've got some great questions coming in. It's a shame we're, we're, we're running out of time, unfortunately, for, to answer those questions, uh, because I've got to throw it over to you now uh, for a quick one minute wrap up. Uh, on where you think uh, you know the priorities are, uh, Thomas, you first to wrap um, up, please. No, I, th I think the, the the three major takeaways which I would like to to give away is really, I mean, there are lots of external factors uh, out there, in particular, um, impacting the skill set and and our our not just our workforce but the work the general workforce in the market. So um, I think we we need to carefully watch what's what's going on and it's really difficult to keep pace of those influencing factors. And the second point is really, um, I was referring to it several times over the last 45 minutes, is really about the shared responsibilities because we as an, as, as an employer, we can provide as many infrastructure tools and policy as we want. If, if we don't have the, the usage and the pickup, I mean, we made a very good point. And if we don't have the trusted dialogue between language and employees, we will not go anywhere with all with all the good solutions um, we, are, we are having. And, and finally, um, I think this, this notion around optionality, I think this is very important for me in terms of flexible working arrangement for all the different generations we have in our workforce. Thanks, Thomas. Naveen? Yeah, so what, what I would say is, um, look, uh, the nature of work is changing itself. Um, clearly, we've seen that. Um, the, the labor market overall will require, you know, humans to work more closely with machines, uh, but a shift towards more higher skill cognitive functions with deeper degrees of empathy. Um, banking insurance sectors will see a net increase in workers. You know, we saw that from ASEAN, 300,000 lost, 600,000 gained. Lots of shift away from operations, back-end processing workers with more sales, service, staff, leveraging deep analytics. Uh, HR teams will have to transition these workers uh, from traditional operations roles into higher value frontline roles. And, and the skills gap is real. Um, and a commitment towards addressing this lifelong learning is, is key to success. So technology can enable growth uh, like RPA algorithms can enable faster acquisition of customers. Cloud computing can enable better quality of customer acquisition. Applications can enable better customer experience and faster onboarding. Uh, and technology can also reduce costs so, um, you know, immersive video can redu reduce travel costs as we've seen through COVID. But the risks are real. I mean, there's risks around cybersecurity, there's risks around personal data management, mental health, lots of areas. Um, but overall, I'm, I'm optimistic about uh, where we're headed. So thanks for inviting me to have this chat. Thank you very much to both of you, both our experts, Naveen Menon, uh, President of Cisco Systems in Asia, and Thomas Bierve. Uh, head of HR Switzerland at Swiss Re. Gentlemen, it was a pleasure. Thank you for, for coming on. Thank you.